Okay, so what are we doing? What are we doing? We're doing we're doing critical friendships among beginning philosophers. It's gonna take way too long, but screw it, we're gonna read it anyway. And uh, it's in discourse. So here we go. There's a research report, so it may not be as philosophically. Uh, well, we'll find out how much philosophy has in it. I don't know. Okay, background and rationale. So we're doing science today, and I don't know what that's going to be like. Students often do not realize that their best resource is each other, or if they do, they are unsure how to help each other without falling into academic misconduct. Students usually arrive at university with habits formed at school, knowing that they will have to work more independently. All too often, they imagine that this means working in isolation, and the sparse timetable of classes universities typically offer them confirms this misapprehension. Our prior research indicates that a low ratio of class time to private studies make it difficult for students to form supportive intellectual friendships with other students on their courses. Many do not realize that independent study means intellectual autonomy rather than co cognitive autarky never seen autarky before but yeah it's like the uh, i don't know what that means actually I should look that up i'm gonna look that up autarky what is autarky characteristic of self-sufficiency usually applied to political states or to their economic si systems interesting okay so it's ru hey shane what's up how you doing so it's ruling yourself but like I mean, intellectual uh, autonomy rather than cognitive autarky. So I guess I'm not I'm not entirely sure what they mean by this distinction anyway. But whatever. Cognitive autarky. Yeah, so you're ruling yourself with your brain as opposed to what? Yeah. Since Semiak says, I don't know whether I ever told you this before, but it's interestingly relevant to this paper that it's only that I have a bachelor's in philosophy and I'm not affiliated with any institution and I'm an autodictac. Uh, no, you didn't say that. Um... I have a bachelor's in philosophy, and I'm not in affiliated with any institution, so there we go. But yeah, um, so you like me. But yeah, I mean, you're going to learn a lot more over time than you will in school. I mean, you can learn a lot in school, of course, but you're going to learn a lot more other places over longer periods of time. So you're just going to pick up more stuff. Uh, well, I know what, I have some idea what you're good at. Like, I understand what you know. Like, from what you've spoke. So, it's like, I don't care about the uh, letters after your name. That's fine. Like, you can... Imp like, as far as I'm concerned, I win at imposter syndrome. I fake philosophy so good that, like, I, I've been yelled at when I didn't call myself a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a degree-granting institution. So, although I actually, one time, I was considering making up a virtual degree. So, like, if you did certain things, um, like, go to certain talks or whatever, and, like, you could, like, you know, take a picture that you went to the talk or you, like, um, you know, participated, you could show participation, like, and you did that enough, I'd give you, like, a virtual philosophy degree. I was thinking about doing that. Like, it'd be a, a bot. Basically, you submit your pictures, and if you submit enough pictures that have, like, geotags in the right place at the right time, then you could get yourself a, vo a virtual philosophy degree. Like, you went to enough philosophy talks that you could, uh, <clears throat> qualify as a, uh, internet philosopher. Uh, yeah, but... The, the whole thing about philosophy is you're fooling most of the people most of the time. You don't actually have to be good at it, you just have to fool most of the people most of the time. And the better you get at philosophy, you're fooling more, the, more and more of the people more and more of the time. Now, if you're a metaphysician, you may go very far, but everyone fails eventually. I mean, unless you're doing something that's, like, <clears throat> got practical uh, results, which there are some areas that have, like, you know, practical things, and then you do actually have to have, like, results. But if you're doing, like, straight-up, like, abstract metaphysics or something, you are going to fool most of the people, well, you, you, hopefully if you're any good at it, you're going to fool some of the people some of the time, but you're going to go wrong eventually. No one gets, like, metaphysics done. That's not going to happen, so everyone in, like, academic philosophy is a poser in that case, because none of them are going to fix it. I mean, you do see some people be like, I know logic. I'm the great logician. It's like, calm down. Calm yourself. I know a lot of logicians. None of them, after a while, like, think, like, they have the final word on things. You just are very, uh, zealous. That's the only time you get those, so, yeah. I, I have a lot to say on, uh, imposter syndrome, actually. I'm like, I win at imposter syndrome. Like I said, I fake it real good. 
So, no degree. Yeah, that's right, Shane. I completely agree. It's like, I exist on bullshit and medical technology, and, you know, what annoys me when I deal with some philosophers is, like, what do you think you're doing? Like, if you're an asshole with your, like, argumentation or your, like, philosophy, it's like, no, 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 don't do that. Like, if you're trying to, like, make a point, like, what's your point? Say it, but don't be an asshole about it. And if you can, like, bullshit and, like, you're trying to use your bullshit to screw other people over, I don't like that. Other than that, like, what are you doing? Like, uh, I guess tell me why, you know, like, I can uh, figure out if it's worth something or not. Yeah. So there's just always a greater variety of situations. And so it's like you can always be good at certain things, but you're not going to be good at all the things. It's just there's too many different aspects to life. <clears throat> so, yeah, don't worry about being a poser. I know it's easier said than done. But, yeah. I mean, I was actually thinking, like, you're told... Ugh, it gets loud right here, the music. <clears throat> but this is interesting. It's like they're saying that you're going to learn most... <laughs> Yeah, Shane, <clears throat> that doesn't work either. I mean, like, you can get better at philosophy, and I hope you do. Like, because you said you, you weren't, like, you didn't know much about it. Maybe you've learned something being here, deal with Aristotle, like the other people uh, in, the <coughs> in the community. But, um, philosophy is really big. Like, really, really big. I only know some of it. It's like, I know some things. Aristotle knows different things. Like you're not gonna learn everything. Yeah, you have to find things that like disagree with you. I completely agree with that in that area, semiotics. You, you, whatever you're doing, you're gonna have to like really push on what you're thinking. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You should want not be shown wrong. You, you should want to like push the thoughts in whatever direction they're going to see what they actually get to. Because for a lot of like thinking, you think you're getting somewhere you're not really getting that far um it's kind of socratic yes um now of course Flo uh, socrates was known for like questioning lots of things but he was irritating about it you don't have to be irritating about it you can you know be pushing it in a meaningful direction and so it's like there is something that is socratic about it but you i would uh, caution against sticking to the Socr like the socratic ideal is a very old idea and it, remember, it got Socrates killed. It's not... It should be... You have to be very careful with that. People want to hearken back. I, I know people um, that, you know, they think it's a good thing to be Socratic. It has not gotten them very far. Like, it has actually probably screwed them because people get tired with someone that is, like, you know, pushing on ideas in all places. Like, calm down. We know everything is wrong eventually. We're trying to see where how far we can get with, like, good ideas. And so... What's the goal of being Socratic? Do you want to just show things wrong? No, that's not really it, actually. People want something uh, worthwhile in what they're doing. Um, and sometimes that involves, like, pushing the ideas hard. But um, when someone feels market, like, there's, uh, they're unlikely to have their mind changed because they feel too busy and being insulted. Um, well, I mean, if you're talking with feel like mocked because they're unlikely to change your mind, well... That's part of it. I mean, how you go about things really matter. And so you have to be careful about these things. And like I said, the Socratic ideal is, it's a, ni a nice idea to push thoughts. And most people don't want to actually reflect on things. It's like, that's not what they want to be doing with their time. They just want the results. They don't want to actually have to think about what they're doing. I mean, I don't blame them. There's a lot of fucking problems in the world. And like reflecting takes a lot of time and effort. And people don't always have that. So I understand. But, um, it's like, yeah, how, what are you trying to get at and why are you doing it? And so just being one, excuse me, just wanting the ideas pushed is not always a good idea all the time. I mean, if you want to do philosophy, you best be pushing your ideas because people get like wrapped up in their ideas. They think it's like, oh, I've got all like these good, smart ideas. Let me tell you something. Everyone has always in the history of humanity thought their ideas were good and smart. Everyone, every fucking, t every century, every day, every person of like in the history of humanity always thinks their ideas are good ideas. That's why they think them and like, that's like, oh, it's a good idea. It's like, I have these ideas and I think and I'm like thinking hard and all that stuff. 
And so for the vast majority of time, like everyone thinks that and it's not actually worth a whole lot. Like it, that's like the natural state of people. Except Woody Allen, does he not think his ideas are good? I forget what his quotes are in that. But yeah, he's a dirty old man, so I, I don't know if uh, he qualifies. There's probably a quote there that I'm missing uh, from a movie, and I apologize. Um, yeah, and if you're going for the, if it was just one of those uh, self-deprecating Jewish jokes, like, yeah, yeah, but they also, like, the self-deprecating Jewish jokes, oh, yeah. Um, but like that's in some sense it's disingenuous like he was making very 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 popular movies that were based on like the idea that you want like this sort of like engagement but he's still making like very popular movies it's not exactly like he thinks like what he's doing is wrong in some grand sense he doesn't think it's wrong it's what he does he does movies very well um, so, yeah, it's just like, so, what are you trying to do? Like, again, it's like, you have to figure out, there's too many things, and like, what are you trying to do? And just the idea that you're going to glom on to, like, the Socratic ideal or anything like that. It's like, yeah, you can glom on to certain ideas, but how long and for what reason? So, yeah, I haven't seen a Woody Allen in a while. But, yeah. Tell me if I got something wrong. I just can't think about Woody Allen right now for some reason. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Ask questions is fine. I don't mind being distracted. But, yeah. Okay. It is rarely explained to them that a group of students can work autonomously on a shared project if they devise or select their own methods and do their own research, or that working alone on a pre-structured and therefore tutor-dependent task may not constitute independent study. What was that? Okay, pre-roll ads are back on. All right, I got to turn those off. Like, Twitch has been going crazy with pre-rolls. Cinesemiac says, I always separate the art from the artist when approaching its social importance, and I think it's important to do that because we might discover anything about anyone at any time, and we can't throw away the lessons or inspiration we can we got from the artworks. Oh, I agree. I, I usually, I sometimes when the person becomes so repugnant, I kind of try to avoid their work, but you have to also find why do people think their work is important. Like, you don't have to study them because to see what they were thinking. You have to understand why, what it did at the time and why. You have to understand it. So it's good to know. And if uh, I've said this before, but if you're going to try to get through the history of philosophy and, find, and only study the good people, you're not going to have any, anyone to read. Like everyone had like in the history, it's like they, no one lives up to modern standards. That's why they're the contemporary standards is because they didn't exist before. So no one lives up to that. Yeah, yeah, that's fair, Cinesemiacs. I didn't think you were appealing to him as a scummy dude. I thought you were meant, like, him trying to, you know, show, like, as a director. But, like, he's a very successful, like, talented director. Um, so, it's like, you know, no one was changing his mind about directing, I don't think. <coughs> yeah. That's why I'm not, like, big on the cancel stuff. Everyone in the course of history is like, no one lives up to modern standards, so you're going to, what do you, cancel all of history? Like, that's silly. Yeah. I mean, this paper that we're reading here already is about how you talk about, like, how you say what it is to work with other people. And it's true. It's hard to do. I mean, the problem with people like me was I was not like the other <laughs> philosophy undergrads. I did not want to talk to them. They were not helping me, and it just annoyed me to deal with them in group projects. I was like, I don't want to deal with you. I already, like, this is not helping me at all. Like, I was just doing my stuff. I was like, leave me alone. I, um, took a lot of philosophy classes, and I mean a lot. I was basically there all the time, and so I also started taking very upper level classes very quickly i didn't care i guess i'm just gonna go take upper level classes i'll figure it out so i started like i took like one i was taking i took a like a, a requirement course it was one of my first philosophy courses so it was like already a mid-level course and then i took some like others that were like a little higher and a little lower or i took maybe a little lower and then i started taking like higher level courses like a semester or two later 
So I think I was, I don't know, sophomore, not, couldn't have been second semester freshman. And I was in this like very upper level course, um, arguing about Frege, which is not easy stuff. It was uh, philosophy of logic and language. And uh, then I was also taking my requirement, which was a lower level course in logic. And I was, you know, it was taught by the professor. And, but when they had a uh, midterm, she had one of the grad students proctor the midterm because she, you know, privilege of being a professor, she didn't have to proctor the midterm. So one of the people in my classes was the one of the other people in the uh, upper level course was the grad student. He was sitting there proctoring. And so uh, he sees me there. He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm an undergrad. What do you mean? I have to take this as a requirement. It's like, he's like, yes, but what are you doing here? I'm like, I have to be here. I'm a philosophy major. I have to take this course. It is a requirement. They don't just like, you don't get like signed off on like courses, like being an undergraduate. It's like, he's like, okay, I guess. I was like, yeah. I'm like, I don't get out. Like, I can't, yeah, like, it, you can't just like get out of undergraduate courses. But he was confused. He's like, well, I'm like, do you think I want to work with like kids that are trying to learn basic shit on like this stuff when I'm arguing with like, be grad students about stuff not really but like what are you gonna do it's like you have to follow the requirements but it's like i did not want to deal with anyone else when i was an undergrad so long story short and it's like i don't want to deal with the other undergrads i had people steal my work i had people i had other kids like i talked to them and then they'd like write the essay according to what i tell them and they wouldn't credit me i'd get plagiarized like that would annoy me i was like thanks for plagiarizing me i'm not going to turn you in i'm not like vindictive about this but like I got stuff plagiarized from me, and then it was a small class, and the teacher was, you know, he was trying to gauge uh, what to grade people, and that was pulling my grade down because it looked like everyone else was doing so well. I was like, I, I could use better grades. I was like, I don't want, like, I don't need, the plagiarism was less annoying to me than it made it look like um, I was more, like, on his level, which he was good, but he wasn't, like, as good as I was at that class. I was like, God damn it like so i don't want to like i was just so annoyed with group projects i was so annoyed with even talking to some of my peers it's like no i don't want to do that no they wrote a paper on a topic that i completely outlined the whole fucking thing he did not quite understand the topic um what he he did not no no what happened was we were discussing uh stuff after class and he was talking about his what he wanted to write his paper on and he was confused as fuck and I broke it all fucking down for him. I said, look, if I was going to do this, this is kind of what I'd do. And he basically didn't change a damned thing in his paper. He wrote this paper exactly what I was saying, using all the points I told him. And he didn't even, like, attempt to, like, do anything on his own. Like, I, like he just filled in the blanks. And uh, the teacher was, like, raving about his paper. And I'm just sitting there, like, in class, because the teacher was going over some of our papers and what we were talking about. And I'm sitting there, like... Like, literally, point by point by the shit I told him. I'm just like, alright, I'm not gonna call you out because I don't hate you, but, like, I don't appreciate that you just basically ripped me off. Like, and I wrote a, diff a different paper, but, like, I'm like, you still ripped off all my work. Like, yeah, I didn't write it. You wrote it, but it was, I just told you the whole fucking thing. <sighs> yeah. So uh, I didn't enjoy uh, hanging out with the fellow undergrad philosophers, unfortunately. Okay. Researchers in philosophy form reading groups, listen to and criticize each other's papers and seminars, read each other's drafts, give each other ad hoc tutorials, and suggest sources. For most academics, becoming an independent researcher crucially involves developing and sustaining a network of scholars with similar or related interests and gaining the skills and virtues necessary to sustain such relationships. This collaboration is almost entirely hidden from readers of books and articles it produces. In the humanities, most research pr products are single author documents. We acknowledge help from others in small print, in a preface, or at the foot of a page where few first year students are likely to notice it yeah i mean that's fair but it's um i don't actually know i mean a lot of philosophy is written solo i mean granted you get a lot of help but um yeah it's a good point like how how much help do you actually get in writing philosophy um some people get more than others 
Instead of explaining and exemplifying the collaborative nature of philosophy, we greet new students with warnings about plagiarism and collusion. This, together with the easily misunderstood instruction to work independently, confirms to them that the university must be a solitary struggle. How-to study guides usually corroborate this impression. Even the otherwise excellent Doing Philosophy mentions interaction with other students just twice. Both these brief discussions suppose that study-buddy relationships are already in place and offer no advice on how to initiate or sustain them. Thus, practical and cultural factors conspire to discover students from forming useful supportive intellectual peer friendships at just the moment the transition to university when contact time with tutors abruptly diminishes. The consequences are familiar to every personal tutor. Students in strugg students struggling in isolation, suddenly deprived of the teacher support they had in school or college, turn in substandard work. Their sense of how well other students are doing may depend excessively on the impressive talk of the confident few who dominate seminars, and they may feel intimidated by imagining the wonderful essays such students write. Their confidence drains away, and their studies have become pur purgatorial. This can happen to students at any point on the ability range. Well, yes, <laughs> exactly, Sinister Max. I'm not exactly sure what these people, uh, the authors here, are thinking about. But again, they said it's going to go into more of a scientific uh, bent. They did like surveys and stuff. So um, we'll find out. Telling students that cooperation is normal may help. However, exhortation alone rarely solves deep-seated problems with their roots in years of school experiences. We need to develop effective ways of promoting intellectual friendships among students and teaching them how to help each other without cheating. Okay, so here's the project. Philosophy has a rich tradition of writing on friendship in such figures as Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, St. Augustine, Bacon, Montaigne, Kant, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Emerson, and Derrida, to say nothing of contemporary treatments of the topic. Like I said, our buddy Aristotle writes on friendship sometimes. Outside philosophy, there is a burgeoning educational literature on learning communities, peer support, peer tutoring, and critical friendship. The first phase of this project surveys and reports on this research insofar as it bears on the typical assessment of instruments and aims of undergraduate philosophy education. The second phase explores the target audience, namely beginning philosophy students. Ideally, one would like to solve this problem at school level rather than at university, or if we cannot intervene at school, we should begin on day one of, of their time at university, that is, a moment when their understanding is still essentially that of school students. An effective intervention requires two requires knowledge of the present perceptions of the target population. Consequently, we formed two focus groups among 12, year 12 and 13 students in two institutions, uh, Peter Simmons College Winchester and Sir John Law's school Harpenden. We used semi-structured discussion to explore their understanding of friendship, cooperation, and collusion. We regard these groups as a source of representat representative student voices rather than as an attempt to identify statistically normal student opinion. The third phase notes the connections between these results and some important philosophical writing on friendship. Okay, so this is interesting. You know, they went and they asked. They didn't actually do a statist statistical study. They went and asked what people were thinking about this, and so this is more of a survey. That's kind of cool. So we're going to find out what people think about talking to each other and then, like, actually maybe talking to each other and seeing how their, like, views change maybe. Okay, learning communities and peer support, a critical review of educational literature. Introduction, what do we mean by peer support? Peer support has been used in British education to involve students in each other's academic and social development since at least the 1950s. Peer tutoring first appeared in the primary classroom where children were used as agents of change for improving the behavior and attainment of peers. In practice, this would mean the establishment of reading pairs and teachers encouraging more able pupils to assist the others with classroom work. However, it was only in the 1980s in the UK with the publication of the first major work on the subject that peer tutoring became more widely widely used in schools and universities. Peer tutoring first appeared in high, higher education in the 1990s and has been used within a range of academic disciplines since. It claims to offer three benefits, one, improving cost effectiveness, two, reducing non-completion rates, and three, improving study and learning skills. The following section will discuss these points in turn. Yeah, I mean, you were definitely putting the responsibility on the kids to help each other as opposed to the teacher, but maybe that's a more effective way of getting anyone to learn is to get like the people to be who are all learning to put more effort in. Um, sure. Peer support in higher education. The development in British universities over the last 20 years of peer assisted learning schemes. I think this is from 2011, by the way. So this is uh, not up to like, it's, it's, this is from a decade ago, this paper. 
reflects. So just keep in mind what we're talking about. The period of 20 years ago for these folks is 90s into the uh, 2000s, not the 2000s into the teens. And so things are different now. Or at least I don't know how they are in schools, but like the world was a bit different back then. Okay. So it reflects the need to assist students without further stretching human and or financial resources. This form of student to student intervention owes much to the North American supplemental inf instruction model, which at its core emphasizes preparing students to learn and empowering them to become autonomous in their learning. Yeah, so they're using the garbage uh, United States model. That's just great. Okay. SI emphasis emphasizes cooperation rather than competition. It uses informal review sessions in which students compare notes, read, discuss, and develop organizational tools for learning. Sessions are often facilitated by older students with experience of the course. SI is now an internationally recognized academic support and retention program. A review of the literature reveals that peer support and being receptive to it is strongly correlated with academic engagement. Kingston explored the effective characteristics who of students who participated in courses that experienced high numbers of students dropping out. She concluded that students on these courses were more likely to have high self-esteem and good levels of interpersonal skills than students on low dropout courses, but less likely to trust their peers as sources of support. So. Okay, on courses with low dropout rates, the opposite was true. Students exhibited a high level of confidence in their peers as so social uh, as sources of social support and exhibited a more proactive attitude to self-improvement. So it is interesting. You're saying, look, the ones that like have high dropout rates, they think they're doing well, but they don't trust their peers because, you know, people are dropping out. Flipping this over, the ones that where there's low dropout courses, um, they do trust everyone else because, you know, everyone's doing okay. But, you know, it's like... Yeah, so the opposite is true. When like everyone's doing well, you trust other people. When a lot of people are dropping, you don't trust them at all. But you, st but they were more likely to have high self-esteem because if you're going to take a course where you know a lot of people drop, you have to think you're good enough to do it. So, in 2003, there were 35 PAL schemes within UK higher education. 61% of these were in initiated for retention purposes as well as widening participation. As is often the case, a program that might benefit all students is introduced to support students who are judged to have particular needs or vulnerabilities. Carefully organized introduction programs focused on building social support networks for new entrants now form part of a widely used student retention strategy across UK universities. What follows are a few selected examples of this, these schemes at work. I remember my, my grandma was a uh, teacher, and she always say, all these things, anytime you um, do a make a claim about all students, benefit all students, you're full of shit. Um, basically, you're benefiting most of the students most of the time. That's the best you could ever do. Um, there's always going to be, you know, the edge cases. There's just too much variety in people, and there's no uh, guaranteed educational, like, one true educational path. Like, that doesn't exist. It's nonsense. So in some sense, whatever you're doing is you're going to be helping a bunch of people, but it's not going to work for everybody. Okay. In Goldsmiths University of London, a PAL scheme exists exist to help first-year students make the transition into higher education by creating a supportive environment. Second- and third-year students are recruited and trained as mentors to run peer-assisted learning groups for first years. A similar scheme operates in Burnmouth University, which adopted a personal tutoring system in 2002. The aim of the program is to enhance the first-year experience within departments at risk of student dropout. Second year students are now paired with those in first year and mentoring time designed into a student's timetable to facilitate learning and ease new arrivals into university life. At the University of Ulster, where peer tutoring schemes have been in existence since 2002, there have been noticeable improvements in retention rates at the university in courses where peer support strategies have been implemented. Students perceive peer support as being of real benefit to them. They've reported a greater ability to retain knowledge as well, enhance creativity, uh, enhanced creativity, greater use of library material, resourcefulness, and increased motivation. To be fair, there's going to be a lot of bureaucracy and like just details um, in any university that you have to work out, and they're not always going to be. People don't always have all the skills, like to know how to go to the library, how to get books out. So that does help because it's going to smooth the uh, transition into learning new bureaucracy. So this is fair. I mean the greater use of library material you're not gonna have everyone have 
under like a good understanding of how that university's library works. Okay, the University of Manchester has established two major peer support programs, peer mentoring and peer assisted study sec sessions. PASS provides additional opportunities for all students to interact with their peers in collaborative study groups within their own disciplines. The sessions are attached to a unit within a degree course and provide a safe environment for students to discuss ideas, share problems, and resolve questions in a setting that supplements the core curriculum. The peer mentoring program at Manchester is less about academic achievement and more about providing a social support network for students. It fosters a sense of community in through informal activity, enabling interaction across the various student cohorts within a discipline. Sessions are informal and can be attached to tutoring, tutorial groups or run independently. In 2008, the university operated a peer mentoring scheme with over 1,100 students acting as peer mentors across 39 disciplines. Often, participants in PALS experience corollary benefits apart from improved study skills. Sheffield Hallam University, for example, has been running a peer support project for Chinese students on a pre-master's course in recent years, integrating them with students on an international business program that involves a placement in China. The scheme was developed by staff mainly to improve the study methods of Chinese students. However, there have been many other reported positive effects for student participants, such as gaining an understanding of a different culture and conventions, etiquette, daily life, making friends to have regular contact with, and overcoming shyness. Fostering a sense of belonging and helping establish friendship groups for students is now a recognized strategy for increasing the enjoyment of the social and academic aspects of university life, and ultimately, as we discuss more detail below, improving learning and critical thinking skills. Okay, so there are these things. I mean, we kind of knew that, but they outlined a bunch of people are attempting to make it more socially or in the cohort in the group of students like try to you know manufacture a uh, relationship between different year uh, students i mean it's not a bad idea like get everyone working together on like the educational ramp to learn more but i mean this is a <laughs> keep in mind then again one of the problems with academia is just, even back when this was written a decade ago, and they were talking about the decade before that, the 2000s, there were already diminishing returns in terms of jobs. Fewer and fewer jobs were opening up at that time. And so it was always going to be a bit of a pyramid scheme. I know academia is not a pyramid scheme, but it's still sort of a pyramid shape. So as you like, you know, get up higher and higher, the people at the top are going to maybe be able to help the students learn stuff, but that doesn't mean they're going to get like jobs and stuff. So it's kind of like you're creating this on-ramp to uh, what? And then at a certain point, you're going to lose all the knowledge and it's like they're losing it to what? Not even a job. And it's like, it's kind of a weird system. But yeah, I don't know if that was like particularly on point, but it's just the, the whole... Uh, everyone helping the, each other up it's like it's gonna fail at the top in some sense yeah yeah i think we're on track for two hours for this paper at this point <coughs> all right the positive impact of peers on learning Programs that focus on helping new students adapt and succeed in the first years of university are only one variant of many models of peer tutoring that have appeared in higher education. Other models include 1. Student discussion groups, 2. Seminars led by postgraduate or more advanced students, 3. Learning cells or what are termed enhanced pairs, a form of learning in pairs which students alternate in asking questions, 4. Collaborative peer learning, a form of learning which occurs through social interaction between peers and is directed towards the accomplishment of a task or problem-solving exercise. 5. Cascading, which involves teaming up with one peer and then discussing with others subsequently. 6. Parainage, a buddy system. and 7. Self and peer assessment. At the heart of the models listed above is the thought that the most effective learning environment is one where learning is a social activity fully involving the learner, preferably in a supportive and non-threatening environment. Social isolation is not conducive to academic achievement. Hey, Akule, what's up? We're reading a paper on how to get people to, you know, work together in philosophy, basically, and how important that is. But, but this is more of a... Uh, is more of a science study. So this is a, something you might actually be like somewhat like a, it might be like provide some interesting things because I know you're in school. So something to think about. Yeah. So 
the thought is that the most effective learning environment is one where learning is a social activity. Oh, yeah, and I hope you're doing well. All's going well for you in the school and stuff. Learning is a social activity fully involving the learner, preferably in a supportive and non-threatening environment. Social isolation is not conducive to academic achievement. We know that learning together in a collaborative and experiential way can significantly increase an individual's learning potential. I don't know what the heck learning potential actually means. But I mean, this is what they quoted from Wallace in 96. <clears throat> The peer group can discourage intellectual interest and growth or conversely invigorate a person's desire to learn. Good, good. Accolade. This is particularly the case for young people where the peers are highly influential. The emergence of personalized learning models in schools and universities in the UK in recent years gives extra emphasis to the value that peers can bring to learning. This approach emphasizes one-to-one -one uh, tuition, mentoring, peer coaching, smaller tuition groups, online support and discussion in order to encourage students to be intellectually curious, learn independently, and self-evaluate. It is based on the idea that learning is an active process of constructing knowledge and less about performing actions in line with teachers' instructions. Fair. Critical friendship. Peer scrutiny has proved a useful learning tool for practitioners across a wide variety of settings. For example, it has been recognized that peer coaching can enhance performance and improve practice in business, medical profession, and teaching. Peer coaching is a term that is often used interchangeably within the literature on peer support. It is not entirely synonymous with, but does contain many aspects linked to the idea of critical friendship. Collectively, the, st the studies above... Mm, the heck... Sorry. Collectively, the studies above reveal how scrutiny under the guise of critical friendship can significantly develop and enrich professional standards, mainly through the development of a reflection, reflective practice. The literature contains many interpretations of critical friendship, but central to most definitions is the acknowledgement that a critical friend is a confidant who acts as a sounding board, providing guidance and support. This model of critical friendship involves individuals assisting each other through questioning, reflecting back, and providing another viewpoint. It is a process that should prompt honest reflection and appraisal. And although it can be an uncomfortable experience to have one's practice scrutinized, it is ultimately one that participants find useful. Yeah, see, this is the thing. You want somehow to get feedback on your stuff and get your bullshit called out, but you don't want it um, to feel that bad. And so it might be uncomfortable, but you don't want to feel that bad. So it's like if you have a confidant, someone you trust their opinion. That's a lot easier said than done, especially for like a nutcase like me and uh, who didn't get along with uh, the other philosophy majors. Um, so that didn't help. It wouldn't help me. Maybe if I found one, it would have been a very different uh, situation for me. But it's like, yeah, it depends who you're dealing with. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think a lot like this is one of these things where it's like this is going to work for a lot of people. It's not going to work for everyone. But yeah, it's like if you had someone that you could talk to and they could call you out and be like, hey, think of this differently or I think of that a little differently. That's a great thing. I mean, not going to say no, but how exactly do you find someone that matches up that way? I don't know. Being a critical friend may require qualities more like those of a teacher than of a student. That may be why Briggs teaching from quality learning at university offers a very short note on student learning partners, but a longer discussion of critical friendship in the chapter on the reflective teacher. These two discussions assume that such relationships require no special virtues or nurturing beyond those found in any other kind of relationship. Beyond Briggs, there are many referee references in the educational literature to the role that critical friendship can play in the development of professional practice. Of particular note are critical friend groups or critical friendship communities for teachers. Uh, Actually, says, fortunately, my high school has a lot of faculty well versed in that philosophy that you trust. I run almost everything I write through them. That's see, that's good. <laughs> I didn't trust it. I didn't trust any of those people back when I was in school, like in my high school. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> did not get along. I was more grumpy. I was grumpier even back then than I am now. So. A much bigger asshole when I was younger, too. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's a good thing, though. Like, that you can run stuff by them and, like, they get back to you with, like, good feedback. That's nice. That's, like, helpful. Uh, 
Such groups usually entail participants in observing each other during lessons and providing support, companionship, feedback, and assistance. They offer a space where individuals can challenge each other in, climate of, in a climate of mutual vulnerability and risk-taking. Absorbing mutual perspectives, explore practice, try and test out new pedag pedagogical methods, and develop a professional voice. Such groups reflect a growing trend for site-based professional development in which educational practitioners behave as managers of their own learning. The type of peer coaching typically contained within CFGs is known as reciprocal coaching as it does not regard one of the parties as an expert, but rather as an equal partner. Critical friendship has also been used to develop leadership qualities among teaching staff and improve school's performance. This study explored the attributes of critical friendship in school learning communities. Swafield use, usual, uh, usefully lists the key ingredients crucial to critical friendship in, the, in this context, at, context as provo provo provocation, questioning, provocative questions, excuse me, an alternative perspective, constructive critique, and advocacy. She describes dialogue as being at the heart of critical friendship and learning. Accurately says, your high school is 160 people, about 40 in your graduating class, very tight-knit community, possible why you trust them. So, yeah, see, I went to a small high school, too. Um, I went to public school, very small, but, like, yeah, no. Like, I didn't, <laughs> I trust them, but not for uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, like, one of the people in my grade, my class I was friends with, she's, like, a uh, top neurosurgeon in New York now. And, um... She's like really, really smart, but when it comes to like theory stuff like this, like I'm not gonna take her word for it. She's super brilliant, but like she's just better at like other things than I am. So it's like it's interesting that like some people have these interactions where they're happy to talk to the other people. The idea that I would go to her to talk about like things I was worried about, hell no, like just would not happen. Um, there's one girl who I would have talked to, but she's kind of nuts. Um, yeah, see, it's, it's weird. Like, I I, I I do have to admit that any time, like, my grade came up in, like, discussion with other grades, we had a very strange grade. So it's, um, very, very strange grade <laughs> compared to, like, other people. So um, I know my uh, experience is not a typical one. So, like, it's, like, you trust them. I knew all the people, but, like, mine, we didn't give a fuck. But, like, it, so I trusted them very much, but, uh. Yeah, not with ac we didn't really discuss academics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I uh once was walking uh through the city and this is during college. I was on spring break and I hear my name getting called out and um I'm like I just keep walking. It's New York. You know, like so what? Like there's other people with my name. But then this person keeps calling. I look over. It's a girl from my high school and She's, like, sitting there. Her, like, spring break was uh, different than mine. It was at FIT. So she, she was uh, into design and uh, painting and stuff. So she was there with her friends. And they one of them starts comes up to me. He's like, no, no, no. Can you explain something to me about your grade? And, like, he was asking about stuff. I was like, oh, that's all accurate. And he's like, well, could you explain this? I'm like, there's no explaining this. This is just how, how it is. Or I said something like that. And he goes, that's exactly what Liz said. I said, yeah, there's no explaining what happened. Acculy says, almost every senior needs to take our school's world philosophy uh, uh, yeah, course. So at the very least, everyone has a baseline understanding of multiple theories. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Like you had a background in that stuff. Um, and she wanted me to write her paper too. Uh, I can't paint, or at least I can't paint. As she had her painting stolen off the wa wall in school. She could paint very well. Like her, her art got stolen. Um, I am not much of a painter. I'd like to learn, but like she was having her st her high school stuff stolen. Uh, so no, like I don't think uh, she ever wanted me to uh, do her work. I almost asked her to prom though. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's just to say, like, my experience it tends to be a little odd, uh, even among just, like, people in my, uh, 
that like had similar experience like from similar areas as I am you know like done similar things it's like even my grade was weird so yeah that's how you know you made it your school project gets stolen from the walls yeah well she was a <laughs> she was that good to begin with uh, our, our art teacher was not that great her art was just that good so <laughs> uh, which was unfortunate um yeah Okay, so yeah, this study sheds light on how best to implement a successful critical friendship strategy among higher education students to achieve participa participant buy-in. Studies emphasize the importance of discussing the concept of critical friendship with students beforehand, taking into consideration as far as possible life histories, cultural background, and focusing on, key on issues of trust and critical debate. They also underline the importance of defining roles and tests as clearly as possible before starting the process. Other vital features are as follows. First, critical friends must be happy to engage in open and honest communication. Secondly, they must be able and expect to ask uncomfortable questions and pre present critiques that may be challenging. Third, the recipient needs to be able to receive feedback non-defensively to be open to alternative perspectives and feel safe in thinking aloud. According to Franzak, a feeling of safety within a CFG stems from three factors, a sense of equality, the group's positive attitude, and the pur purposefulness of the work. See, this was my problem. I didn't have a sense of equality with the other uh, philosophy majors. And so this is why I, like, I'm the oddball out here. I was not getting along with them. Yeah, exactly, Vipers. How are you? Um... The idea is, of course, that if you can get along with, like, if you think you're all in it together, you will be able to pull each other up. And uh, that's, I completely agree with that. But I, I never had the uh, sense that we were all in it together. So, <laughs> yeah, make friends. Or I guess you could all pull, you could all sync with the ship, too. Yeah, we're, we're discussing this paper on uh, how getting, like, you know, a good peer group actually can help uh, you with your philosophy going forward. Uh, these are just like not my regrets but like things that like I, I did I did not have so, so I'm not regretting any of this but like it's like I just never had any of these like things that they said they wanted that would be good to have <laughs> okay a common issue affecting critical friendship is an initial reticence about exposing one's work to peers this reluctance studies show may be reduced by participating participants being able to choose their own critical friends in the initial stages diversity among students was seen across studies on critical friendship as a resource a rich source of intellectual growth indeed the multicultural characteristics of cfgs in the van smith study appeared to aid students in the process of seeing other perspectives and viewpoints cfgs ran more smoothly when small in size because then discussing each other's work does not take too long finally the literature warns that developing CFGs may take time as participants, perhaps for the first time, learn to talk, share their work, and think in a collaborative way. Of course, of course, both aspects of critical friendship, learning to give and receive criticism and becoming friends, takes time. What's going on here? Things are breaking. Okay. Yeah, so I mean... Like I said, if you have someone that you can, like, bounce ideas off of, that is great. And so we're trying to manufacture friendships here. These studies and other literature on critical friendship illuminate a number of barriers to critical friendship. The most common issue concerns the uneasy marriage between the norms of friendship with those of critique. The practice of criticizing friends' work can cause tension and discomfort. This is common amongst but not confined to students who can be particularly reluctant to evaluate peers and provide an assessment of their work. For many, critical friendship contains an obvious tension. As Handel observes, criticism is usually conveyed by someone who represents contrasting or alternative points of view or other interests and who may even be hostile to us. However, as he notes, a real friend is someone who on is someone on whom we can rely and who will even hold a critical mirror before us when necessary. The theme of trust arose spontaneously in the focus groups, and we will return to it in section 3 below. In a study of critical friendship practices among trainee teachers, a number of practical tensions were identified relating to indiv individuals' reluctance to criticize peers. 
participants would often leave problematic assumptions unchallenged, limiting their feedback to safe feedback, and recipients would often resist hearing criticism. Critical friendship requires individuals to develop diplomatic and constructive ways of communicating feedback to others. See, this is getting harder and harder to pull off over time. You have to be really good at vocalizing criticism without making it so critical. And it's asking a lot of people, actually, to do that, especially in philosophy, where, you know, tensions actually can get... People take their philosophy very, very, very seriously. You have to be careful about this, and it's hard to tell people that... I mean, Shane was here earlier. I don't know if Shane's still here. You can't be telling people that, like, the things that they grew up believing are wrong and not expect a uh, hostile reaction. It's like, you're going to get that in history teaching. You're also get that in philosophy and, like, religion areas. Um, because this is, like, stuff where people were taught this is how the world is and they've based their lives on this is how the world is. It ain't so easy to, uh, you know, say things in a nice way when you, you're you basically going for the throat. <laughs> yeah. And that's what a lot of philosophy is, is going for the throat. See... For those of you out there that are not professional philosophers, philosophers quite often in certain areas will be going for your throat. And I'm not kidding. I will never participate in a philosophy of physics um, conference ever again because physicists are nuts and they will go for the throat and uh, and like they are rude people and they will say mean things. And philosophers of physics, you know, they're still sort of philosophy people, but you get physicists there and it's just like I'm never going back to a philosophy of uh well, that's not fair. I'm never going back where there are like people that were going for the throat like I've seen sometimes. I've been to very nice philosophy of science conferences, but that were only philosophers. I'm not going back to anything that was like actual physics, uh, physicists dealing physicists and philosophers because it was just like it was crazy. And I was just it was impolite. It was mean. And it was like treat people trying to treat each other badly. And you're like you don't want to deal with those people and they exist within philosophy too people are trying to knock each other down what the fuck brendan lavore is british he's focusing on philosophy in a country where actual friends greet each other with how are you you fat cunt um yeah i mean <laughs> uh, I, this is the thing it's like you need a lot of uh i mean this is the funny thing it's how do you actually get people to, you know, talk nicely to each other, as you so eloquently point out, Vipers? Not so easy to do. Barriers to collaboration in the context of critical friendship may include defensiveness, differences in communication style and cultural norms. Other barriers may be seen as more practical, such as unavailable space within institutional or inappropriate available space. As Klein notes, learning through collaboration and critical inquiry necessitates both a physical thinking space conducive to talking, sharing, listening, and a thinking environment, a set of conditions under which people think for themselves and think well together. We call that the bar. A thinking environment necessitates equality, appreciation, limiting assumptions, respect, ease, the space that a thinking environment needs to stay intact, encouragement and diversity, incisive questions, attention, and information. According to Klein, competition in a thinking environment is particularly hazardous. Yeah, this, this is like, this is insane. I've seen insane things happen in philosophy, and I'm sure if you ask Aristotle, he's seen insane things in philosophy too. Things can be very hazardous. Like, it's strange in certain sense i've been to a, a job talk in new york where things went just bad for the poor uh person giving the job talk and it was just it was ugly it was very ugly people got mean and the person yeah they're not going to get the job they don't need to feel terrible they don't need to feel worse than they already are um when the job talk is going south like it was just not good and it's like in when a job talk in philosophy is for those who don't know to when you get like a when you apply to a job and they think you're kind of good they fly you out or you fly out to them or whatever it is and you give like a you know a teaching sample or something and you know and you give a talk uh in front of the department and everyone shows up and you know you're they evaluate what your sort of research looks like and so this is you're trying to present your research in the best way but they're also trying to you know push you a little bit and um it's incredibly comp competitive because this was a major school in new york and uh you, these are 
high level jobs everybody wants them the competition is insane and i actually mentioned this years ago to somebody else and they were like oh yeah people have been talking about how bad that was for years it was crazy and it's like that's how bad it was was that i thought it was crazy but then the other people thought it was crazy too and like other people used to talk about it but it was just it was kind of disgusting is really what it comes down to people don't need to be treated that crappily and i was going to ask like a softball question and they didn't even get to me or i might have gotten skipped because you know they were trying to get to all the people uh in the department but like i forget what happened i was depressed i want to ask something that might have actually been a nice question it was weird <clears throat> okay in order for a person to think well they have to be encouraged by the listener without smelling a, be a bead of envy or competition from them yeah you, you're not gonna get that uh, competition from them is gonna happen a lot in philosophy people are competitive competition may mean one participant steering the other away from a great idea by suggesting they concentrate somewhere else this happens constantly say oh look at this idea conversely if the person thinking is competing with you trying to seem more clever or competitive people are competitive in philosophy just is they will not be able to pursue their own ideas honestly or fully competitive listeners are thinking inhibitors i can guarantee you if you go to philosophy talks you're going to get people that are going to do all of these things and it's not always like the jerks, like the people putting on the thing, but you're going to have people that want to A, show off how smart they are. They're just competitive. Um, they're going to want to tell you how great their idea is and that you should be looking what they say, not what you say. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's like these are like common things in philosophy. And so this is like, it may sound good, but this is actually a rather big ask, like for all these things to happen. Handel 2009 argues that it is our attitude towards criticism that requires challenge. He claims that it is that it should be seen as an academic virtue, then rather something to fear, resist, or avoid. He notes that a critical approach is already a highly valued tool for assessing the quality of ideas and outcomes within academia, so there is no reason why this cannot be the case in other areas. Indeed, he sees it. Indeed, as he sees it, critical appreciation is a central element of academic identity. Handel defines good criticism as generally relevant, argumentative, well-documented, and something we learn from. Among academic philosophers, Handel's definition is platitudinous, though perhaps honored in the breach more often than we would care to admit. The fact that he troubled to make these remarks at all is a useful reminder that these apparent platitudes about the value of criticism are part of a professional identity that incoming students and their school teachers do not necessarily share. Much of the literature insists on the desirability of a safe environment without always noting the tension between this and the mutual vulnerability and risk-taking to which Atkinstein and Meyer allude. You know, in other areas, my brother is uh, an engineer, and when he was in school, um, one of the kids was just an asshole in his group and uh, made it look like he would backdate his own notes to make it, make it look like he had come up with all the good ideas, which was not true. And... Um, then attempted to uh, take credit for, you know, the project they were working on and then wanted to go patent it. And so he had all the backdated notes. He, like, didn't note his work. And then he so he backdated all their other ideas. And so, like, he was trying to steal everyone else's ideas. Um, it's like... <laughs> a lot of this is so much easier said than done. I mean, the guy never did anything with that research. But, I mean, it, it's like these are things that happen. Okay, although we have been exploring the value of critical friendship above, the literature also confirms that friendship per se can have a power effect on learning. It does not necessarily require a critical component. I wrote defines a learn informal learning as any kind of learning which does not take place within or follow from a formally organized learning program. The control of learning rests primarily in the hands of the learner. It is unstructured and does not take place in a classroom. Robert's ethnographic study of student nurses in clinical practice practice sheds light on how informal learning can be a powerful byproduct of friendship. His study reveals three key themes relating to friendship and peer learning. Firstly, that student nurses develop an ask-anything culture among their peer group and see each other as valuable sources of information. Secondly, they see each other as disc a discrete group who are in the same boat and develop their own community to help each other out. See, that's great. If like they do see each other as like trying to get through all the same stuff that and you can go to someone because if you don't know something maybe they do that's nice 
Thirdly, knowledge is not linked necessarily to seniority. Within clinical practice, student nurses in this study collaborate in order to learn, constructing their knowledge informally through shared experience and practice. Friendship provided the medium through which vicarious learning took place. Peers are clearly a rich resource for enhancing the learning process, whether or not their roles involve any formalized means for providing critical critique and feedback. This fact has led some commentators to argue that educators need a fi- need to find a way of capitalizing on informal learning opportunities, helping learners to make their vicarious learning more visible and rigorous. Okay, it's like, yes, if you have more friends in the group, you're probably going to get pulled up with them. All boats rise, you know, one of those sort of things. <sighs> Why does peer coaching lead to improved learning? It has been claimed that peer learning promotes, among other things, working with others, critical inquiry and reflection, communication and articulation of knowledge, understanding and ideas, managing learning and how to learn, self and peer assessment, but how? Constructivist educational theorists influenced by Piaget and Vygotsky underline the importance of conceptual conflict as a means of provoking individual reflection and ultimately improved conceptions. Uh, Lady Shusky explains how critical cognitive conflicts, as Piaget called them, provoke new ideas and refine thinking and problem, uh, problem, uh, problem solving skills. You know, it's a problem solving thing having to read all these names just the first time through. That's a problem. When a learner, through discussions with another peer, becomes aware of a contradiction in his or her knowledge base, the learner experiences a lapse of equilibrium. The learner will initiate strategies to restore equilibrium, for example, by engaging the peer in working together to find a solution that both can accept. Yeah. This view is echoed by Anderson, who notes that social interaction offers a natural corrective to the egocentrism of individual thought. We try out our ideas, and often our interlocutor is better able than we are to evaluate and offer critique of them, perhaps even offering a contrasting view. Peer coaching and collaboration encourages individual development through a process of purposeful inquiry based on reflection and action, leading to enhanced metacognition. Baird claims that metacognition encompasses three components. Metacognitive knowledge, knowledge about the nature and process of learning, personal learning style, productive learning strategies. Two, awareness of the current learning task generated by the learning, the learner asking appropriate appropriate evaluative questions such as, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And then instituting procedures to find out the answers. Three, control of the current learning task by having learners make purposeful, productive decisions based on their increased level of awareness. Bood claims that metacognitive learning has been shown to lead to a deeper and more lasting learning. Below are some examples where metacognitive learning has taken place within a number of peer support learning models in higher education. First, small group teaching, SGT, is particularly conductive, conducive to improved metacognition. The main publication on this teaching method states that SGT is all about helping students learn with and from each other through the promotion of active interpersonal communication. It commonly occurs in student-led SGTs, which can mean four to eight students developing a learning set or tutorless tutorials, which support a constructivist approach to learning. Students are encouraged to take responsibility for their learning. SGT simply facilitates discussion. SGT often includes peer tutoring, self, and peer monitoring, where participating students are called to think beyond what they have been given or taught. This requires a degree of collaboration and free exchange not commonly found in other forms of teaching. SGT or peer learning in pairs, for example, is much more effective for transmitting information and for achieving a higher level of conceptual skills. I mean, I agree to all this stuff. If you have to, like, teach it to all your other people, all your friends, and you have to communicate it, you're going to have to go over this stuff in a new way. And it's going to be very helpful. I mean, I always hate it, and I hate it. People that would say, uh, when you're trying to explain philosophy, you have to explain it like you're teaching it to, like, a five-year-old, like a toddler. If, like, if you can break it down to explain it to a toddler, then you then you actually know it. Um, I think this goes back to, yes, the Feynman uh, technique. I fucking hate the Feynman technique. Like, what the fuck does a five-year-old know about anything in the world? You cannot be teaching five-year-olds, uh, you know, like, actual good philosophy. You might teach them, like, some, like, toy example, but um, I always hated that. 
Um, and then one of my teachers said, I don't know what if I told my teachers, I don't know what a five year old would understand anyway. I'm not five. I don't even get that. He said, well, teach, well, explain like you'd explain to your grandma. I said, my grandma's really smart. She'd understand what I'm talking about. And then the teacher shut up saying that sort of crap to me. Um, but like, yeah, this is the thing. If you have to go over it with people that you think are smart people, then you will have to break it down. But like you have to break it down in ways that they understand. And that's good enough because if you can understand what they understand, then you're actually getting this meta level of things. And that is and that is definitely a, a good perspective to have. <coughs> but yeah, you're getting like various rants on like things I dislike about education at the moment. The Feynman technique being one of them. Yeah, I mean, what the fuck is a five-year-old going to tell me about philosophy? And why should I have to explain anything to a five-year-old? Like, I find that nuts. Anywho. Within the literature on what is termed action learning, the positive benefits to students of working with others, other course participants, normally in small groups, are well documented. Studies talk of the camaraderie that can develop within a learning set. These personal think tanks are places of mutual support, a safe place to explore project and self, a place where friendships are formed, a place to be challenged, a place to get feedback which is both positive and negative. Second, Lady Shusky describes her peer coaching meetings intended intended to provide students with a safe place to discuss learning objectives and questions stemming from their real life project assignments peer coaches each received a one hour orientation on peer coaching and its relationship to management management education and professional development students also received a guide to peer coaching the duration of the peer coaching relationship had a set of set time of 12 weeks to receive credit for peer coaching all students were required to submit peer coaching reports to that described that describe their experience based on around set questions. The report, along with the students' learning objecti objectives and an excerpt from their learning journal, was worth 20% of their overall grade for the unit. Their peer coaching reports showed the enhancement of critical thinking and the heightened heightening of metacognition. In other words, the students understood their own thinking better, were able to take control of it, and do it better. To summarize, there is an overwhelming consensus in the educational literature that student-student coaching and critical friendship deepen learning. They are particularly helpful in developing intellectual independence, especially when the participants are members of the same class or cohort. On the other hand, excuse me. On the other hand, the authors survey different diff the authors surveyed differ in the relative emphasis they place on the safety of the thinking environment and the risks associated with genuine criticism. Okay, so these are, I think everything above now is, um, was like, you know, stuff other people had done. And they were talking about like, you know, different groups like, yeah, like management people and like nurses. But now we're going to go to like students in like the uh, 12th, 13th year. Um, so yeah. Okay, method. So this, we're getting a little sciencey here. It sounds like they're just outlining a method here. Against the background of this literature, we conducted two focus groups, one of eight students at Peter Simmons College, a sixth form college in Winchester with over 3,000 students, and one of 10 students at Sir John Law's school, an all-ability co-education LEA maintained secondary school in Harpenden with an annual year seven intake of about 180. Each group discussion took just over an hour. We presented the questions on a PowerPoint slides, but we allowed the discussion to range freely. We first asked the students, what sort of activities help you to understand a new topic? And what resources are there at school or college to help you learn? This was to test whether they spontaneously identified their working with peers as an aid to learning. We then presented them with this quotation from a student nurse. When you begin university, you are told all about the support available to you, but the most important support network is never mentioned, fellow students. No one can empathize with you like another student can. With the topic thus introduced, we invited the students to, con to contrast the friend who helps you with your academic work and an ordinary pal. What extra skills, knowledge, values, and virtues does the former need to have? Next, we specified academic friendship as critical friendship, explaining that this idea has practical application among teachers, from trainees up to head teachers, and asked the students, what do you make of this idea? What problems do you see with it? How might these problems be solved? 
we also wanted to explore the idea mentioned in section 1 that resistance to critical friendship might be minimized by allowing participants to choose their own critical friends in the early stages. This runs into a potential objection. The idea, very common in discussions of friendship amongst the ancients, that the true friend is the very opposite of the flatterer. We asked the students to discuss whether flattery has any place in friendship generally and academic friendship in particular. Yeah, I mean, how are you supposed to know who's going to be good for you? Like, how do you know that ahead of time? You're not going to. Granted, it may mean a lot less, like the distinctions between people and like the group. Like you're all got, you're all there because, you know, you had certain characteristics that the school wanted. And so you're probably all kind of more similar than you realize. But how do you actually know you're going to get along with any of these people? And how do you know, like, someone's not going to just flatter you and stuff? Okay. Author says, we then asked the students whether they wanted to revise or augment their answers on the contrast between ordinary and academic friendships. Viper says, slight tangent, but a few days ago I learned that the Trinity College, Dublin's University Philosophical Society, aka the Phil, is the oldest student coll collegial and paper reading society in the world, founded in 1683. Oh, that's kind of cool. I did not realize that. Um... Yeah, that's neat. Trinity College. I mean, maybe that even goes back like to Hume and stuff. So it was like uh, David Hume. That's kind of cool. Yeah, my my dates are just wrong in my head, but uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean the uh, Newton came later, and uh, he did, of course, the uh, Royal Society for uh, Science. And, like, but that's been around for a while. But, like, there's always been, like, there's been the uh, philosophical societies where they were reading papers and stuff. It's interesting. Okay. To keep the peer-to-peer -peer aspect in view, we asked the participants whether re reciprocity is an essential element in academic friendship. Here, we were interested in students' views as to whether a one-sided academic fr friendship could possibly work. CF Franzak's point above about the importance of equality in critical friendships. Compare here to Emerson's claim that the only way to have a friend is to be one. Our prior research identified anxieties about plagiarism and collusion as barriers to informal peer support, so we asked how can students help each other to study without cheating? How can students help each other with essay writing without cheating? Yeah, and this was my problem. My shit was getting stolen. Like, I would tell people stuff and it would show up in their papers, and I mean, it happened that one time that was completely egregiously, it happened other times too, and it annoyed me. Like, I'm not gonna, like, call someone out, like, uh, in school it wasn't worth my time to uh, call people out for cheating but like it just was uh it's like this happened to me and i was like i you know i, I didn't stop talking to people about like the philosophy stuff why would i but like it just did leave a very sour taste in my mouth when it happened yeah our inquiry is motivated by a search for effective interventions so we asked what conditions or activities would be conducive to forming and maintaining academic friendships and could social networking sites make a difference to academic friendships if so how the target for this research is the assumptions that students bring to university with them. So we ask, do you think your answer to all these questions might be different at university? If so, how? Finally, we ask students how many contact hours per week they expected to have at university. Results. In, a, in answer to the first question, no students identified each other as a resource. Invited to explain why, they said that their peers wouldn't be able to help them as they lack topic knowledge. There were anxieties about the rel reliability of information gained from non-teachers. Most seemed to assume that help must mean explaining curriculum content. Called, uh, called on to elaborate, some participants observed that new students won't have any more idea than themselves how to write essays. More advanced students are more useful because they may have worked out study techniques. One participant did eventually say, the best way to learn something is by teaching it yourself. Asking for help from a teacher is easy because teachers are there to help, but asking from a student for help is awkward as that person may not want to teach. Also, the participants report pressure, reported pressure not to reveal struggles and weaknesses. You do not want to admit that you are falling behind. This suggests that the going that going to another student for help is seen as an as exceptional remedial event rather than a normal part of learning, which connects with a common feature of many of the programs reviewed in section one. Furthermore, they observed that fellow students can be competitors. Some felt deeply anxious that their ideas might be stolen, even though A-level marking is on an absolute scale. One student's mark is not affected by an, uh, affected if another benefits from a borrowed or stolen thought. One lamented that essays are not covered by copyright. Yeah, but this is not true. 
like you, you're still competing in like a job uh, sense. Like if everyone's getting A's, then your your A gets washed out. And so like even though you like and if especially in um highly competitive field philosophy being one of them if everyone has good grades then you are not standing out anymore so like it's one thing if like you're in like high school and like there's you know getting into college might like getting into college is hard what am i saying but like if it does like if the grades don't matter then yeah it doesn't matter but you know when you're in these hyper competitive situations which we are in nowadays where you're competing with people from all over the world it does matter it's like you're not um getting a there is no easy pass like just by like helping someone else out is going to water down the field in some sense. Um, even though if it's only a little, I might be over harping the point cause I'm bitter, but like whatever. Um, well this also happened to me for other reasons too. And like that was stupid, but, uh, it did happen. Oh, what's up Valpo? How are you doing today? I hope you're well. Yeah. We're reading up on, uh, this paper is, you know, talking about how you can, you know, have a peer group that will help you in school and what the prospects are for philosophy. And it's just, uh, you know, I think it's all very good, actually. It's just I've had a what I'm I'm an oddball to begin with. And so, like, uh, most of this does not apply to me. So I find it all kind of alien to my experience. But I understand that this would work for most people um, who would be good. Yeah. It's like and I'm annoyed that, like, some of my stuff got plagiarized. It's like, well, Yeah. And I, I'm, I can tell you, the teacher didn't give me as good of a grade that time my stuff got plagiarized because he said everyone else had upped their game too. It's like, no, they didn't. I upped their game. They did not. And so I actually was told that like I didn't get as good a grade as I might have because other people were doing better. I'm sorry, Valpo, but it happens. Thank you, Twitch. You're working as intended, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, so, and there was um, grade curving at my school for a long time, although the philosophy uh, department eventually got themselves, um, a, 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 what the, you know, they, they didn't have to do that. But eventually, like, they, the administration came down on the philosophy department saying you have to curve your grades. You, they have, you know, for every person that gets an A, someone has to fail. And they were like, yeah, these are upper level classes with five people in them. No one's taking this class is going to fail because they're all like motivated uh, majors in this. So we got exempted eventually, but like it, this was a problem. So the idea that like, I, even though every A-level marking is on an absolute scale, that wasn't the case in my uh, university. At least not when I was a philosophy major, things were curved. Eh, I know it happens. Valpo. It's too bad when it does, but we miss messages. So, yeah. Okay. How do you think class factors into this, given the acceptance of each one teaches one in suppressed communities? Yeah, they were definitely saying that um, this definitely matters in some sense, that there's going to be cultural differences, and if you're going to be getting... Um, like people from different classes someone's not gonna want to listen to someone from another class perhaps um yeah this is that's just one of the barriers they mentioned it earlier saying this was a barrier to be overcome they didn't really give a lot of detail about how to overcome such things but um yeah yeah I don't know it's like it's not going to work I mean I mean this is not everything's going to work because for various reasons, but like class is going to be one. Um, you know, it's like you could just have the wrong accent and people don't want to talk to you. It has nothing to do even like, like the stupid things. So Valpo says class seems important here. The philosophy majors make money. Discourse is happening lately, but a lot of that folks is going into law and such. Yeah, that's fine though. Um, and philosophy goes into business philosophy majors um i remember when i was in school there was a lot of actually one of the first uh, data points that came up that philosophy majors make money was people were doing um business and philosophy uh double majors and uh that turns out to be very good because you know business people need to like think outside of the box and so people were starting to do that and so it shows that philosophy is a good stepping stone but Again, this would go into the competition problem that they've been talking about. That if, again, if there's only so many uh, 
seats at the table, you're competing with each other, and it does not help that, uh, it's like, if you're trying to make friends, it's like, it's not always the right environment to make friends when there's so much competition. <sighs> yeah, but I do try to tell people that philosophy makers make money, just not me. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know what exactly I say about the class. It's complicated. Like, how do you get people from different classes to work together? How do you get them to, like, you know, take each other seriously? Not so... I, I don't know. And I don't know what these people would say either. Okay. In response to the questions about s the skills, knowledge, and values and virtues required of the friend who helps with academic work, participants said that maturity is one of the mo is more important than intelligence. Yeah. And that's a hard-fought thing. How do you actually get maturity, especially if you're dealing with people in different classes when you don't treat people the right way? By maturity, they seem to mean discipline and focus. One said it was more about the person's work ethic. Another said that an ordinary friend with a good work ethic is better than someone who is merely knowledgeable. The academic friend who would ha friend would have to take the academic side seriously. The relationship just cannot just be based on hanging out. Here and elsewhere, there was a tacit admission that time set aside for study is too easily and too often spent messing about. There was some ambiguity about whether the academic friend is also a regular friend or merely a utility relationship. One participant suggested that you wouldn't choose someone who, is, who wasn't already a friend. Participants eventually assembled a demanding list of qualities that an academic friend should have. An academic friend should be blunt but polite with it. Truthful, have some knowledge about you as a person. See, that's the. this is part of the class thing. Knowledge of you as a person. That's hard. Have good morals, do what's morally right for you, and have the same values as you but, but different complementary skills and knowledge. Your academic friend should challenge you and take you out of your comfort zone. Whoever thinks maturity is more important than intelligence is a shithead. No, is a poopy head. <laughs> Thank you, Vipers. That's very insightful. There was a spontaneous suggestion that reciprocity is a good thing in friendships. Your academic friend need not be some someone cleverer than you because you could work things out together. It's, it is noteworthy that the idea of our intellectual near equals working things out together is what the researchers understand by academic friendship, but this picture emerged only late and fleetingly in the participant's contribution. One participant opined that while it's nicer to and better for a friendship to be reciprocal, more likely one party will be academically stronger and persisting in such an equal relationship requires moral strength and self-respect from the weaker party. Note that this remark assumes that one party is stronger than the other across the board. One participant observed that the reciprocal academic relationship, help, relationship helps to develop the independence required at higher level, at higher levels, meaning year 13 in university. One, a one-sided academic friendship would foster dependency. Indeed, one participant said that the academic friendship had, has to be reciprocal to be a friendship. Otherwise, it is a teacher-student relationship. Then the student won't feel able to challenge the teacher, so the debating activity would get lost. In addition to maturity, discipline, focus, and a will to learn, the participants identified patience as a cardinal virtue in academic friends, followed by kindness, efficiency, reliability, and communication skills. In contrast with the remark about the value of reciprocity, one participant suggested that a good academic friend should be someone a bit, a, a bit better at the subject than you. Another suggestion was that that academic friends should have contrasting opinions, though this was quickly qualified by the thought that this is unlikely because friends tend to be of a like mind. I mean, even if you're of a like mind, that doesn't always mean you do things exactly the same, so. When invited to think about critical friendship, the participants, for the most part, reiterated their remarks about academic friendship, but with greater emphasis on the trust that arises from a friendship that is not only about mutual criticism. Indeed, one participant was very clear that there had better be more to the relationship than criticism. Critical friendship should have some fun stuff in common. There should be a means of de-stressing within the relationship. This, they thought, would most likely arise if the friendship precedes the criticism. Similarly, a well-established friendship helps communication. It's easier, less hurtful if the critic knows you and shares shared humor makes the criticism 
easier to take. At any rate, the critic must not act superior or even constructive, constri con uh, constructive criticism might be taken badly. A potential good academic friend is someone who already knows your faults and doesn't think less of you on account of them. Yeah, see, this is the thing. If you had the good friend already, then a lot of the problems are solved. But going the other direction is going to be more difficult. How do you get someone who's like going to be smart and critical and then going to treat you the way you want to be treated? That's questionable like how are they going to know how you want to be treated um that's going to be a painful process okay when thinking about the tension between friendship and criticism the theme of the work already cited in atkinstein and meyer the participants noted a natural reluctance to hurt a friend's feelings however some insisted that real friendships require warts and all knowledge and criticism one went so far as to say that a real friend is more critical than a merely academic friend the question focused on qualities required of the critic but participants noted that critical friendship requires maturity possibly the most often used word in the discussions from the person criticized can friendship be taught i mean that sounds like aristotle uh, in terms of like you can make good friends out of habits um it would also be weird in some sense because you're teaching a skill like swimming in some sense. Like I can tell you how to swim like right now. That does not make you a good swimmer. So I could tell you what a good friend does, but that's not going to make you do it. So I don't think I think you have to in some sense. It's like, was it uh, you have to feel something for the other person? Like you have to agree with them. And so, yeah, it's uh, you go back to the Aristotelian stuff is I think it makes it a little harder to uh just teach people how to be good friends you can tell them when they fuck it up but like that's corrective um so yeah i don't know if uh being a good person or being a good friend can be taught people have to work on that shit um and i mean i'm not aristotelian either so it's just like the idea that like habit is going to inherently go uh one way or another is not going to like make you a good person even if you give them habits okay here you go bdsm peer support club i mean what's the club made of in that case uh wood uh vipers um it's closer to the can virtue be t taught from uh, Plato. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Like, being a good friend might be considered a virtue. And then the question is, can you actually teach virtue? Well, I mean, Aristotle famously went from habit to a uh, virtue, which uh, is questionable in my opinion. I don't know how habits turn into virtues. Making someone do something a lot does not make them uh, continue along that path. Um, Again, in this situation, what they're talking about here is that you are already in a group that is in some sense aligned in a certain direction. The answer is yes, by the way. Um, okay. Uh, so it is a wood club for your BDSM. Good to know. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the whole thing in the BDSM, and I don't know much about it, is like you have to have trust. You have to have like permission and stuff like that with what you're doing. And so, I mean, that is basically what a lot of BDSM is, um, you know, trust and, you know, permission. So with permission is the thing. And Viper says friendship can't be taught. I am um, basically agreeing with Vipers and I think um, Valpo too. That this is a harder thing to be taught, but again, if you put people in the situation where you're all in it together, there's more of a chance that you're going to make friends in these situations. And a lot of times in this sort of like pressurized academic environment, and if it's like incentivized that you all work together, you might make more friends that way. Of course, you're going to get the psychopaths too, that like, you know, are trying to, you know, uh, operationalize the, the friend group to their own benefit, but you're always going to get some psychopaths. Viper says, the most violent demographic are toddlers. They have no impulse control or all pro-social behaviors taught through a process of socialization. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. And so it takes more time to figure out what kind of person you are, what kind of person you want to be and how to do this stuff. And assuming you're not a shitty person, how to be a good friend and like good to other people. But like teaching that stuff, it takes a lot of self-reflection and teaching self-reflection is not so easy. And that's one of the things that these uh, people keep noticing is the maturity um, requirement here. 
and teaching maturity. Yeah, it's like asking someone to teach maturity. I don't quite um, know if that even makes sense. Because, like, maturity is something gained over time and reflection, not something that, like, you can beat into someone. You might beat some discipline into someone, but that doesn't make them mature. That just makes them, you know, cowed. Um, so, yeah, this is, like, a hard thing. Again, how do you, like, get these friends? It's, um, and you can't figure this out ahead of time who you're going to get along with. It doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how to... I was thinking about how you get from habit to a virtue before, not that long ago. And I don't... I came up with something, but I mean, I don't think you can go from habit to virtue as easily as Aristotle kind of wanted it to happen, conceptually. I mean, I don't think he thought it was easy. I just think the conceptual jump from habit to virtue is not so clear. And, uh, like, Aristotelian Nicomachean ethics gets abused, too, because it tells you that you should be excellent at stuff, but it doesn't tell you exactly what is excellent that you should be at. So you can be like an excellent asshole. And I think you get a lot of those. Okay. Both groups raised the possibility that the critic may end up learning from the friend criticized. Participants noted that academic friendship may require both parties to swallow their pride so that disagreements don't damage the friendship. The critic must be able to distinguish a difference in views from an objective error or fault. Professional academics know that this is a tall order that is not all that not all reviewers of papers and books manage to deliver. Yeah, again, yeah, like this is not easy to do and it's basically a lot of wishful thinking that you're going to have someone that can actually, uh, you know, be objective, not even objective, not to be a dick about your criticisms. The participants identified several features that suggest a role for educational institutions in mitigating the tension between criticism and friendship. They pointed out that while a friend may find gentle ways of putting critical points, someone who has been given the role of critic is just doing their job, so there is less danger of criticism hurting. This distancing effect can be enhanced with explicit marking guidelines. So that so you're going to give people a rubric to evaluate philosophy? Uh, I mean, that's good for like teaching people how to like follow a rubric. I don't know if that's actually going to get you any good ideas, though. Okay, so that the criteria of criticisms are part of the task, not personal to the critic, and clarity that the work is being criticized, not the author. In other words, part, both parties should understand that criticism is primarily an encounter between work and criteria, not between critic and victim. Critics should find something to praise and understand that everything starts less than perfect. Taken together, these points explain why students were more comfortable receiving criticism from teachers. One participant observed that it is a teacher's job to criticize, but it's not obviously part of a friend's role, so crit someone could be offended by a criticism from a friend. You know, this isn't terrible. It's like you need to have a rubric in some sense. So there is some sort of semblance of you both know what the standards are and then how, fa how far are you... Uh, diverging from the standards in your criticism then you could say well that criticism is unreasonable at that point or it, the criticism diverges from the agreed upon standards because I don't like saying unreasonable um yeah so it's like how far did you get from the standards uh, and this is one of the problems with my stuff also is that uh, my stuff always I don't know if it is true now but everything starts very ugly and then shapes up at the end so it's like it used to start that way. So it was like you could criticize me all you want, but like that's this isn't how I work. And so this isn't going to work for everyone's, uh, you know, way they actually go through things because some people they start from a worse spot and then it raises up at the end, even though other people can, you know, sort of like incrementally get better at, uh, you know, increase the quality of their work. But that's not exactly how my stuff ever went either. Okay. When asked about flattery, participants replied that there's a time and place for flattery, and some suggested that mutual flattery can be an enjoyable activity. Another side viper said, Novice-novice pair programming is discouraged in software development because both participants tend to adopt each other's bad habits. That's amazing. Yeah, so you've uh, instead of helping each other, you just multiply the mistakes. Uh, see, that's, yeah, see, this is an interesting thing. It's like, if you don't have good programming practices, you're not there's no guarantee you're going to get them um, just by talking to someone else who also does not know what they're doing. Like, good programming practices is a hard-fought 
uh, victory. It's, it's been hard fought over time. This is like syntax and logic. People just assume this is how the logic looks. It's not the case. This has been a hard fought thing to get people to discuss logic in a certain way. And that's very similar to programming, to discuss programs in a certain way, in uh, certain ideas. And so this completely uh, lines up between the logic and the programming. You don't want people writing logic all over the place. You want to force them into a f very specific system. And then the logic works much better. Otherwise, you get mess. But like this is, I think that's a thank you, Vipers. That's a very good example of why certain things is like asking your friends is not always a good idea because you might just be multiplying uh, mistakes. Okay, there was some disagreement as to whether flattery involved praising without meaning it, that's deception, or could mean it sincerely complimenting. None identified the flattery of omission, of failing to point out faults, nor was there any awareness of the place that selectively positive feedback might have in the building up of a student's confidence. When pressed on the choice between warts and all frankness and flattery, some participants finessed the point by insisting on the importance of timing in truth-telling. When invited to discuss cheating, one participant said that if there is a definite line between giving someone your work and generally coaching them, helping without cheating includes coaching in method and technique, going over background information, providing signposting phrases, explaining what sort of answers exam boards look for, pointing out flaws in essays, suggesting ideas, mentioning the key points and supplying an answer to a different question. One participant said that you need to be taught in such a way that you develop your own style and original ideas. This is, use this is a useful reminder that the best protection against plagiarism is in intellectual independence. Students who patch together essays out of found materials sometimes fall into plagiarism when they forget to record where they found some snippet. Students who create their own arguments do not run this risk. You see, right there, students who create their own argument do not run this risk. But like, that's the whole problem here. You're talking about doing it together. Um... It's like, this is the difficulty. Like, plagiarism is going to happen. Like I said, I got bit by this before. Not badly, but I got, I was annoyed about it. It's like, but yeah, there's a limit between what people should be doing. And I'm sure the guy who ripped me off, he knew exactly that I had, like, he was taking my stuff. But we weren't, like, that good friends either, so he didn't care. That's like, I was unimpressed. Actually, I think he gave the uh, keynote address uh, at graduation. For the department. <laughs> yeah, people loved his essays. I wonder where he got them all. When asked about forming and maintaining academic friendships, participants returned to the theme of trust. Character flaws and weaknesses should be tolerated and not broadcast to others. It comes back to trust. On the other hand, participants were much more positive about competition than Klein and other educationalists reviewed in Section 1. There was a sense that friendly rivalry is always healthy. Friendly does not mean rubbing it in the other person's face and must not be essential to the relationship. That is, the friendship could continue if the rivalry were, were suspended. Some participants were frank about the motivational power of their desire to beat the person who is, at, uh, who is top. Others talk about academic friendship as a means to explore extracurricular activity. This is what I mean. Philosophy is like this, though. This is a, this is um, a thing in philosophy. They want to be top dog. Facebook and the internet were considered to be distractions. However, email conversations are more likely to stay focused than face-to-face -face conversations with mates. Again, this is dated. This is from 2011, I believe, this paper. Here is before some participants sheepishly acknowledged a tendency to muck about in time intended for a study. Moreover, participants valued the ease and discretion of electronic communication. Internet conversations can be easily terminated, require little commitment, and need not be visible to the whole peer group. It is easy to prevent the relationship from, be, from becoming more intimate than intended. Facebook friending involves no commitment, under, unlike an exchange of phone numbers or email addresses. And messaging is invisible to all but the sender and recipient. Yeah, see, this is either naive or this is before, like, public Facebook posts became a thing where this stuff would all get published publicly and then it would cause problems, as I think happened to our friend Infernal. Um, like, yeah. Like, you have to be super careful about this because there is a paper trail online. And so the idea that this is invisible doesn't mean it's not there. Oh, yeah. No one said so, but the thought seemed to be that you can chat with someone online without being seen to do so by your friendship 
group. Internet chat can be worked in with other activities and therefore does not require the same commitment as going to the library with someone. One observed of Facebook, you can post a question on your status and if someone gives you something that is complete rubbish, you can disregard it without hurting their feelings at all. One participant said that you have to be more of an individual learner to learn things over the internet. That is, uh, someone who d doesn't have to be shown. Oh, um, I don't know all the details, Valpo, but she... Someone was screwing with some of the funding, I think, in one of in her department or something. And she went on like a rant uh, on a private Facebook post and it got published. Someone screenshot it and sent it around. And it caused a small scandal in the university, I think. Um, I don't know the details. I would feel bad if that was wrong, but it was a private Facebook post that someone uh, made public without her uh, knowledge and it caused I think a stir um, and <laughs> I think it's been kind of uh, may have been one of the things that has like you know caused a bunch of hassle in her life in the last bit but yeah so <coughs> yeah it's some bullshit but uh yeah, you'd have to ask her. I don't know. I don't remember the details at this point. <sighs> when asked how they thought things will be different at university, the participants confirmed our hypotheses about their expectations. They expressed worry about plagiarism and knew that there would be less contact time than at school and sixth form college. Nevertheless, some were surprised that contact hours at universities and the humanities can be as little as eight hours per week or less. Isn't that like nothing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, how much are you going to bother the professor? Participants thought that there were more, there is more point to academic friendships and social networking at university because school exams are relatively pres prescriptive, whereas university involves extra research and need for debate. As one put it, you have to use your own head. There was a sense that university study is a different animal from anything the participants had directly experienced thus far. Rather touchingly, there was an expectation that academic friendships will be easier to form at university because students at that level are more mature, that word again, and have a desire to learn. Our prior research into the experiences of philosophy undergrads included some quite bitter expressions of disappointment that their thirst for learning was not as intense as the undergraduate body had, as had been expected. Yes, yeah, like you're going to find out people are not as, uh, not what you think they are. That's true. At the same time, participants felt that the university would be more competitive than school because of the last stage before the job market. Participants saw value in peer friendships as sources of support. They will be, they will all be new to the experience and thus in the same boat. And the discipline, you have to be more honest with your friends at uni because there are no parents to keep them in line. Yes, yeah, like this is the thing. You are getting all grouped together in some way. And so the, the whole same thing on in the same boat. Okay, philosophers on friendship. See how long are we at? Two hours. Yeah. See how much more of this we got. We got a bunch. This is a 20 page. You have to get to page 20, I think. Yep. Okie dokie. But this is what we were trying to get to because we've had people. Dis we've discussed friendship in uh, Philosophy Roulette before. And uh, Aris has done stuff on this. So, Philosophers on Friendship. How do these naturally occurring thoughts connect with some of those found amongst philosophers, ancient and modern, who have written on friendship? Is there anything in this literature that could be used to encourage new undergraduates, school leavers, school leavers? That's a weird phrase. To think about how best to form beneficial intellectual friendships. To begin with, there seemed to be little in the student's default understanding of friendship that echoed the idea found in Aristotle and Cicero amongst others, that true, fr true friendship is possible only amongst good men, those in, uh, those in possession of the necessary virtues. Friends for the students are, first of all, those with whom you hang out and muck about. Or as Aristotle puts it, the friendship of young people seems to aim at pleasure, for they live under the guidance of emotion and pursue above all what is pleasant to themselves and what is immediately before them. Yeah, that's not all of it, Aristotle. I mean... Kids have different virtues from uh, adults because they're kids, and that's part of the thing. But like, so the idea that you need uh, adult level virtues to have adult level friendships does not mean the kid level virtues don't have kid level friendships. It doesn't make the friendships any less real to them. In fact, it might make it more real to them. And so it's they're not just there to have 
be aimed to have pleasure. That's how, that's the get off my lawn old people view of kids. But that's not how it is when you're kids. That's how it is when you've forgotten what it was to be a kid. Okay. However, once the discussion got going, the importance of the academic friend possessing certain values, and I don't even actually want to say, of course, there are some friendships that are just to hang out with. <coughs> okay. However, once the discussion got going, the importance of the academic friend possessing certain values and virtues came increasingly to the surface. One of the most frequently recurring virtue words was maturity, by which they meant, among other things, the capacity to set aside immediate pleasures and settle to, to some work. In other words, Aristotle was right about young people, but he failed to do justice to their recognition of this tendency in themselves and their efforts to overcome it. The participants also used maturity to refer to emotional continence in the face of criticism. Yeah, this is the thing. Aristotle was too get off my lawn old, uh, old guy at that point. One of the questions that came up in the focus groups concerned frankness. This is a central theme in philosophy of friendship from Plato's Lysis onwards. The importance of honesty and the related idea that flattery is the very opposite of true friendship. Without honesty, Cicero claims friendship has no meaning. To be sure, the on the relationship between friendship and flattery, one encounters different views. William Hazlitt describes friendship as a flattering mirror in which we see our virtues magnified and our effort, errors softened. On the subject of flattery, the participants in the focus group talked about the friends' role, the role friends have boosting each other's confidence, especially in the face of criticism that magnifies errors and downplays virtues. Here, your friend is the person who nurses your wounded pride when your work has, been, has taken a critical battering. Hazlitt's remark captures a truth about friendship, but many, perhaps most philosophers, take a more strenuous view of the matter. Viper says, to your point, it occurred to me a few weeks ago that my taste in film has changed over the years. When I was young, I looked for experimental indie films, subjecting me to experiences I wouldn't have otherwise had. Now that I'm old, experienced, overworked, and bitter, I look for a filmic comfort food. Yeah, there's different things that you're going to look at at different times. I like That's absolutely right. And, you know, you're going to need different things from different friends, too. Um, yeah, it's just how things are. You're going to need different things at different times and different things from different people. Um, and you don't want to be, and the thing is, don't forget how you were when you were younger also, because you're discounting your, like, just because you were younger and you, you knew less stuff, doesn't mean you were stupid for being, you're stupid, like, you might look at yourself as, like, I, I think, like, oh, I was dumb back then, but, like, that doesn't mean you were dumb given what you knew at the time, you may have been very smart, and so it's like, you don't want to get the uh, get off my lawn like the old person forgetting what it is to be young uh, sense of things because you might be doing things for the right reasons at that time too. Yeah. They, okay, so other philosophers insist that recognizable through mutual admiration societies may be <laughs> recognizable though mutual admiration si societies may be the kind of flattering mirror Hazlitt describes is not true friendship at all. Writers in antiquity, Cicero and Plutarch, discuss in detail the problems of how to distinguish a flatterer from a friend, and in the early Christian era, when there is considerable discussion of especially Cicero's view of friendship, St. Basil the Great and St. Jerome make much of his idea that flattery destroys friendship, and that true friendship thus demands a degree of frankness. Basil insists that the flatterer speaks to give pleasure while the friend refrains from nothing, even that which causes pain. This echoes Cicero's claim that flattery is far soft, far sorrier than frankness, for by failing to call wrongdoing to account, it lets a friend fall to his ruin. It is an essential part of true friendship to offer and receive admonition, but it must be offered courteously, not peremptor peremptorily, and receive no forbearance, not without, re not with resentment. By the same sign, we must maintain that there is no danger more deadly to friendship than servility. Sick Sycophancy flattery. It it is this failing to call wrongdoing to account that most interests us here. The focus on safety referred to in much of the literature reviewed in section one tends to overlook the fact that to reduce anxiety to zero would require backing off from making incisive, that is to say, cutting criticism. This is a kind of flattery. What in section two we have called the flattery of om om omission or silence. This is weird. Flattery of omission silence. It is not over buttering up, but this failure to mention false would be, in the context of academic friendship, a failure of such friendship. I mean, yeah, if you are giving someone feedback on their paper, it's not that you're, you, 
can hold back on the stuff because if it's obvious to you, it may be obvious to someone else and then their paper is going to fail in philosophy if uh, they're missing things that are at least somewhat obvious. Cicero is a major influence on the humanist writers of the Renaissance and among them Francis Bacon in his essay on friendship describes faithful counsel from a friend as one of the key fruits of friendship. Approvingly quoting Heraclitus saying that dry light is er dry is ever the best dry light. We have no idea what Heraclitus actually meant by dry. Let's see. We've got a Heraclitus quote. Woo. Willful violence hubris must be quenched more than fire. Okay. Thank you, Heraclitus. Yeah. Dry. Like it, I think this is now quoted also a dry soul is the best also, but I mean, we don't know what that means. Like, he asserts that certain it is that the light that a man, a man receiveth by counsel from another is drier and purer than which cometh from his own understanding and judgment, which is ever infused and drenched in his affections and customs. That's interesting. Oh, an idea of like drenched as uh, wrapped up in, a, in your emotions. Okay. In other words, the honest friend brings something that one simply cannot provide oneself. However, in the group discussions, the participants insisted that there must be more to a critical friendship than criticism. There should be mutual affection and shared humor, recreation, and values. <coughs> this suggests that, to use Bacon's metaphor, faithful counsel is a fruit of friendship. It is not the whole tree. Moreover, as the participant noted, the participants noted the commonalities that constitute the friendship also make it less likely than the academic friend will offer an alternative point of view. Valpo says, I think it's a weird Neoplatonic thing, at least since Porphyry emotions are wet and messy. Yeah, I don't know, um, like the, like, yeah, I don't know exactly what, how they were using wet back then. Um, although I do thank Shane for correcting my understanding of how, uh, colors work worked back way back when in like other cultures when people had less use for color distinctions but like there might be something similar with the wet and dry stuff um but yeah i mean that would be something really interesting to look into that we had fewer distinction need for certain distinctions and so like ones like wetness and dryness might have been used um differently uh, more generally like for emotions this youthful kind of friendship with its origins in pleasure and play is likely to hold between friends who are infused and drenched in the same affections and customs as each other and therefore not as dr dryly challenging as Bacon might have hoped. In any case, one of the affections in which a pair of friends might be drenched could be a passion for a particular intellectual pursuit. As noted, some of the group discussion participants identified shared extracurricular curricular or curiosities as grounds for the sort of friendship that might become an academic or critical friendship. A friendship might originate in a shared interest without demanding shared opinions. C.S. Lewis claims that the man who agrees with us that some question little regarded by others is of great importance can be our friend. He need not agree with us about the answer. Yeah, I mean, if you both think something super important but you disagree with it, it's like that's your debate partner. I mean, that's kind of like what politics is quite often. You might both think the other person's wrong, but you like discussing with them because they have a different point of view. You get this, yeah, politics. Compare this with Lady Shusky's assumption, quoted in section one, that the root out of eporia, that is the criticism induced disequilibrium he described, must be towards a solution of acceptable to both discussants. A solution acceptable to both discussants. However, where friendships do hold different opinions, uh, or hold the same opinion with differing intensities, it may not be easy or even possible to explore these differences. As Nietzsche observed, human relationships rest on the fact that a certain few things are never said, indeed that they are never touched upon, and once these pebbles are set rolling, the friendship follows after and falls apart. Yeah, quite often. Students are, aware, students are aware of this danger. Their reluctance to criticize each other's work is not merely the expression of a preference for safety and ease. Nietzsche's solution is to remember that our opinions and those of our friends are not simple products of reason. Viper says, random fact, I'm two miles away from C.S. Lewis' childhood home. Wow. Uh, doxing yourself. But yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, yeah. There's like, it's funny. Uh, I mean, I'm like two, less than two miles away from uh, Mark Zuckerberg's childhood, childhood at home right now. <laughs> but yeah, C.S. Lewis is a 
more interesting person than Mark Zuckerberg. Okay. Nietzsche's solution is to remember that our opinions and those of our friends are not simple products of reason. Rather, they are the, ne they are the necessary consequences of the indissoluble interweaving of character, occupation, talent, and environment. Reflection on this thought ought to make us less inclined to claim truth for ourselves and impute error to those who disagree with us. In this perspective, differing opinions become evidence of differences in character, occupation, talent, and environment. This way of looking at differences offers the uh, possibility of mentioning the unmentionable, of handling and hefting the pebbles which, if allowed to roll free, would threaten the friendship. No one cares about doxing in Belfast. Take a left at the paramilitary mural past the burnt out car. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm I'm, almost, ugh, I'm in New York metro area. Like, I can tell you, I, I very close to where I am, and there's like a million people right here. It doesn't matter. Like, I'd have to be really specific about doxing myself for for it to be a problem. Yeah, and Valpo's is uh nearby some like trees or something. <sighs> Got some very nice rocks by Valpo. <sighs> yeah. Friends with a deep appreciation of Nietzsche's point may be able to treat their different convictions as hypotheses of equal standing. A feeling for the dependency of one's opinions on the contingencies of one's life may come only with experience, that is, with noticing changes in one's opinions consequent on changes in occupation or environment. Nietzsche's observations suggest that the psychological conditions necessary for Cicero's courteous exchange of criticism are complex. The soldierly Roman virtue of forbearance under critical fire will not suffice. Rather, we must come to regard our nature as a changing sphere of opinions and moods, thus learning to despise it a bit. Oh, there are cool fossils in the region. You know, this is a good point I think the author make or Nietzsche really makes, um, or Cicero makes. You have to realize most of our thoughts don't really add up to much and they do change over time. It's like you everyone thinks they're i think i said this earlier but everyone thinks their thoughts are like great everyone likes their own thoughts what they generally think about stuff maybe not so much uh what was that uh <laughs> director woody allen but um or the character woody allen plays really but um it's like you have to realize a lot of our thoughts are just gar gonna they're gonna be lost to time so you have to kind of take your step down a notch for any one of them because a lot of this stuff changes over time and stuff you didn't think was going to change will change too maybe not everything but a lot of it can change okay this insight into the process that form and reform our opinions may not be readily available to the young it may be part of the maturity at which our focus groups kept gesturing it can be manufactured sometimes by presenting students with philosophical intuition pumps that drag their opinions first this way and then that. Some students do learn through such exercises to despise their own opinionated natures a bit. Others learn to despise philosophy. A second and related theme is the importance of trust. Here is Cicero again. The foundation of the steadfastness and loyalty for which we are looking in friendship is trust, for nothing endures that cannot be trusted. Several of the students' comments showed that their tacit agreement with this claim. Trust was one of the reasons why some students thought that academic friendship, friendships could, could best or only arise from a pre-existing friendship. <coughs> Voice is starting to go. Perhaps this echoes Emerson's thought that a friend is a person with whom I may be sincere, before him I may think aloud. This thinking aloud is clearly an important part of the mutual working through a problem central to academic friendship. Why would one not wish to think aloud before a stranger? The obvious possibility is that our thoughts are unfinished and we do not wish to commit them to them publicly. They may have logical faults we have yet to detect. And yeah. <laughs> this is like the entire premise that I don't give a fuck at this point. <laughs> this is why I, I just talk about philosophy at the moment. <laughs> So yes, you may, you're getting my thoughts on shit, and I do not care if I have faults, or I don't care that much if like they're recorded, which is a benefit of not being an academic. It's like I can have this stuff clipped and not feel bad. And I, I mean, I publish everything to YouTube too, so it's like, eh, fuck it. <clears throat> there are, <laughs> but yeah, this is one of the reasons why uh, like other people don't always save their vods. 
there are other dangers. Our thoughts may violate a taboo or to be or be open to misinterpretation or expose us to physical danger. The participants' uh, comments on trust indicates three objects for it work, feeling, and reputation. If I show you a draft of my work and ask you for your critical opinion, I trust you not to steal my ideas, I trust you not to ridicule them to my face, and I trust you not to disparage them behind my back or publish them without my permission. The first of these was clearly present in the minds of students who worried about having their ideas stolen, even though such theft could not affect their own academic progress. The second of these three kinds of trust goes beyond refraining from overt ridicule of the work and its author. For the participants, it is part of trust that the more skilled or knowledgeable critical friend should not be patronizing, should not act superior. This again echoes one of Cicero's claims, the most important thing in friendship is that the preservation of a right attitude towards our inferiors. So many times there are among us men of extraordinary distinction, such as Scipio was in our little group, yet he never set himself above those of his friends who were in, of inferior station. This reminds uh, Vipers of the process of forming a bit in stand-up comedy, except that it's done in public. Uh, interesting. Yeah, stand-up is very difficult because you're gonna, you can bomb in stand-up too and it's painful for everyone involved. The third worry about risk to reputation was especially acute for the participants in our group because they saw going to another student for help as a remedial action and therefore ev evidence of academic weakness or falling behind in the course. Yeah. I mean, people going to college, I mean, especially these uh, nice programs that they interviewed people at, you're probably going to get like some of the overachievers from like the uh, high school or secondary school experience. So the idea that they would have to go to their friends to get help in like a high school course where things are admittedly, maybe they might be a little difficult, but not that difficult. So like the, you're going to have a different experience because you're going to have the people going on to further education were able to do the work in the past. So this is definitely a, uh, there could be a different like sort of sociology in high school when you have people that haven't ever had to uh, work very hard. Um, and then when they get to college, they might have to work a bit, a bit harder. And so they don't realize the different ways to go about working hard is to discuss things with your peers. Okay, this connects to with the big the final big theme, reciprocity. This cropped up in the literature reviewed in section one and emerged in the student discussion too, though only once in the discussion, only once the discussion shifted from peer teaching to peer coaching. The connection the students made between reciprocity and intellectual independence interests us greatly. Several f philosophers of friendship make much of the theme of reciprocity in friendship. Consider, for instance, Aristotle's pessimism about the prospects for lasting friendship between unequals. The difficulty of friendships between unequals is the reason, Aristotle writes, why there is a question whether friends really do wish for friends the greatest goods. If my friend gains the greatest goods to the point where his stock far surpasses mine, it may not be possible for us to remain friends. Education aims at increasing students' store of knowledge, skill, virtue, and wisdom. Since different students gain these goods at different rates, it is not to be expected that a pair of academic friends will remain academic equals indefinitely, even if they begin as equals. In this student discussion, reciprocity seems, seemed to take numerous forms. First, the mutual respect that the friendship implies. As noted, some students introduced the ide interesting idea, absent from Aristotle's account, that the good friend is someone who already knows your faults and doesn't think less of you on account of them. Second, the idea of being companions in pursuit of a common project. The student discussion moved from the assumption that the person capable of helping you with your work would be someone more knowledgeable or skillful than you to the idea that it doesn't have to be someone cleverer, you could be working things out together. This centrality of focus on a common goal recalls C.S. Lewis' contrast between erotic love and friendship in The Four Loves. Lovers are always talking together about their love. Friends hardly ever talk about their friendship. Lovers are normally face-to-face, -face, absorbed in each other, friends side-by-side, -side, absorbed in some common interest. Oh, interesting stuff there. Oh. Discussion. What can educational institutions do? Yeah, so I guess this is finally getting to the uh, question Valpo and uh, Vipers and others were discussing that can you actually teach people to be friends? 
A meta theme of our investigation was maximizing the intellectual benefit of critical friendship while minimizing the emotional costs. In the literature reviewed in section 1, we noted that various writers talk about ensuring our feeling of safety, etc., and Klein condemns competition as an inhibitor. So explain a circle jerk, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> Yeah, that's a question of biology. If we had our dicks on our sides, we'd be, we'd be facing a different way. Um, but we would claim that you are not, in fact, safe if the criticism is real. Your work is in danger of failing to meet the required standard, and you are in danger of falling into aporia. So while confidence building is important, and the tone and manner of criticism and reaction to it have to be policed, we should expect a sense of danger to remain so long as the criticism remains vi rigorous. The students in the focus group knew this, which is why they returned repeatedly to the trust between mo trust between friends. Trust is necessary because and because and insofar as something is at stake and could be lost. This is most obvious in dangerous activities such as diving and rock climbing, where trust between companions is essential. Both of their characters both of their characters and competence. When students are invited to criticize each other's work, they often do so very tentatively and make only the most anodyne suggestions. This reluctance to wield the red pen arises, we claim, from a combination of awareness that feelings and reputation are at stake and ner nervousness about their competence as critics. Imagine going on a diving course and being invited to check someone's breathing apparatus before you have learned how it works. The students in the focus group said that explicit marking criteria make it easier to evaluate their own work and that of others. The successful mentoring and peer, student, peer support schemes reviewed in section 1 uh, all include some training. It follows that if we wish students to participate in a version of the cultural the culture of mutual criticism in which professional academics work, we should offer them some guidance in the art of editing, criticizing, and reviewing. Few philosophers, if any, are ever trained to referee journal articles or review books, which is fucking obvious when you read reviewer reports. Most of us pick it up as we go along. This, though, n this though, not how most professionals maintain. This is though, not how most professionals maintain standards. Usually when people are given new roles and responsibilities, they get some training in how to fulfill these. Suppose one were to design a training course for journal referees, what, what, would, it, what would be its content? Would exercises, what exercises would foster the required virtues and sensibility? Yeah, be more mature. That's basically what we'd end up yelling at them too. Such a training course should include some discussion of the virtues of a critical friend, such as we have begun here. These virtues have application whenever one person criticizes the work of another. Yeah, skull, yeah actually, it's not so hard. It's a principle of charity. You have to understand what it is to be charitable to someone else's thought. And that's not easy either, and it's a lot easier said than done to uh, find the best uh, possible version of what someone else is saying. Not so easy. Okay, these virtues have application whenever one person criticizes the work of another, whether they are friends or not. There is no reason why anonymous referee reports on papers submitted to, act submitted to academic journals should not be friendly. That's hilarious. This is hilarious. There is no reason why anonymous referee reports on papers submitted to academic journals should not be friendly. I can give you any number of reasons. But everyone's overworked, tired, and pissed off right now, and that makes it very hard to be friendly. Um... Like, I can just give you lots of, like, also, people are grumpy in philosophy for lots of reasons. Like, I could go on why these things are not friendly. They should be friendly, but there's lots of reasons why they are not friendly. It's because people are tired. This imagined training course would include reflection on the distinction between disagreement and incompetence. There can be a competent presentation of an argument that the critic disagrees with, especially in philosophy, where arguments aim at plausibility and phenomenological recognition rather than empirical or mathematical validity. Few would deny this principle, but the problem of distinguishing dis disagreement from incompetence in practice could bear further discussion. It's very hard to tease these things out, though. Very hard. Because just because it's... um. You think it's plausible or there's some phenomenological recognition. That is extremely hard to actually teach people to see the world in a different way. That is what phenomenological recognition is. And I've had people say, look, my intuitions differ from you. And I'm sorry, but I just am going to reject your paper because of differing intuitions. And, I, and they apologized to me saying that they were sorry that this is what it came down to. They just couldn't see what I was saying, even though I gave multiple examples of what I was talking about. I would love to hear what they thought about those examples 
animals they probably just thought we were being irrational but like this is like part of the problem is you can't show like you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink you can give people examples of a phenomena but you can't make them see what it is people will just discount the way the world the way you think the way the world is if it does not fit with the way their their mindset is Viper says, so no one told you your referee report was going to be this way. Your paper's a joke. Your intellectually broke your academic career is DOA. I, <laughs> that was good, Vipers. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. So, like, this is, even though this sounds good, I don't think this uh, there's, like, a good way to actually distinguish between um, showing people that there's a disagreement versus incompetence. It's extremely difficult. The aim of an intervention such as this would be to help students achieve the double distancing mentioned above. Double distancing is valuable even between friends. Perhaps your friend can put things in a way you'll understand and be can be aware of and can be, and can beware of your red buttons. Perhaps you already trust each other and forgive each other's faults and have ways peculiar to your friendship of de-stressing and recovering from conflict. Nevertheless, critical friendship requires competence as well as character. A training in criticism a criticism of this sort must be a must be part of the mainstream development of academic skills. One of the barriers to the development of critical friendship is the perception among students that asking for help is exceptional and remedial. This is regrettably corroborated by the tendency of institutions to introduce peer support programs in response to difficulties experienced by specific student groups, such as international students, students from non-traditional backgrounds. Yeah, here we go. Now we've got the class stuff coming in. And other who, others who are judged to be at risk of dropping out. Yeah, again, this is uh, who's doing the judging here. Judged to be at risk of dropping out. So again, this is what you're going to have as like treating people as outside groups or needing of special help. And that ostracizes folks, which is not good. Training in how to help peers framed as in induction into research practice might go some way to embed the idea that mutual assistance is a normal part of academic life, even for the most senior academics. Yeah. No, I'm not going to tell that story. Okay. <laughs> Another assumption is that the focus group participants shared with many of the programs reviewed in section one is that the proper sources of help for students and staff are more advanced students and students are staff and more advanced students the students referred spontaneously to students in the years above many of the peer programs we surveyed are in fact programs in which advanced students mentor beginners this reflects a deeper assumption that the help must be in the form of a teaching rather than critique as we have seen pr principally in the focus group results there is a close connection between genuine peer support that is between academic near equals and the development of an of intellectual independence as noted in section one, Handel defines good criticism as generally relevant, argumentative, well-documented, and something we learn from. Training in criticism should offer a process in which criticism is written down. This is actually rhetoric. You, uh, this is something I lament. There's no training in rhetoric anymore. How do you say things in a nice way? It's rhetoric. You have to be careful here. Writing requires the critic to think a little harder about the criticism. It makes criticism more effective and more open to challenge. It is not uncommon for journals to supply questions or outline headings for, to referees. Some suitably modified example could serve as a useful tool for students learning to criticize the work of others. That's true. Um, I don't know how helpful the um, rubrics actually are in philosophy. I've been asked to referee a few times and uh, I recall one of these rubrics it wasn't bad I don't know if it was particularly helpful but it was like you know seemed uh, like it gave the editor an idea about how you were thinking about the paper so that the editor could judge how to read your report so that they would understand like how what you were saying fit into like the journal standards um, that's kind of what I got out of it so I thought it was good so that like the uh, referee's report would go back to the journal to um and could be better like evaluated for the quality so that like the referee's uh stuff wouldn't be misconstrued but it wasn't actually for the uh i felt it was more for the journal than for the uh author yeah 
Okay, for us, one of the most valuable outcomes of the focus groups was to be reminded of the significance of peer groups. Among students, your friendship group fixes your place in school or university society and is thus expressive and, to some degree, constitutive of who you are. Finding an academic friend with all the prospects properties we have been discussing may require violation of these structures we see this at the univer at university students of a students of a sort flock together even when doing so is clearly against their academic interests in cases of collusion it is almost always weak students colluding with other weak students this point about social structure emerged in various ways most obviously but not uniquely in the discussion of facebook the students seem to be telling us that the dis the, the discretion and lack of commitment on Facebook allows them to get around the constraints imposed by their social structures. No one need know that you are messaging a nerd, and anyway, it's not proper friendship if it's only Facebook. The question for institutions then is how can we design buildings, virtual environments, and activities that offer possibility of discrete and non-committal peer review, peer support? Um, so it's interesting that they're talking about this in terms of Facebook, which of course nowadays we wouldn't be saying this. Nowadays we'd be talking about the um, the text um, rephrasers because there's you can get like a you know a sentence from a book or something. You can plagiarize someone else's essay, throw it through one of these um, AIs that will rewrite it and kind of have a similar meaning and that way you have like a unique essay that's never been written before and will sound good on a topic and you didn't actually write it. So this is going to be the next thing. You're not going to be asking someone else that knows how to do it. You're going to be using a, uh, you know, an artificial intelligence, an intelligence service to augment your, uh, your writing, uh, possibly entirely, but like, yeah. And why would people wouldn't feel bad about that because you know it's easy and it's available and it's hard to hard to catch so it's like how do you actually get people to learn stuff as opposed to use the automated surface very difficult i don't know but um i don't know how plagiarism software is gonna have to um get better because people would already spend uh you know like go to fiverr or something or one of these uh sites where you can pay for someone else to write your paper and you could do that already but now this is just making it way easier to do it and so the idea that like there's going to be automated services that going to uh help you with all this stuff is also gonna is a contemporary problem okay anyone have any questions about this damn paper took a long time to get through this one two and almost two uh yeah over two hours uh i hope you're happy uh cinesemiotics Viper says, that's an issue in programming at the moment with the GitHub Copilot and AI, which suggests code based on what you've already written. Yeah, let's just go steal open source uh, programmer stuff. Uh, can't wait. Yeah. So that's, again, that's another one where, where you start describing or start writing your stuff and then Copilot grabs similar code to what you've already gotten. Or I don't know how similar it is, but an AI suggested code that might be able to do stuff um, write down like code that can do what you want to do without actually you having to understand how it's working or that you could have written yourself. Um, so yeah, very difficult problems in terms of going forward because that's clearly not learning anything. How to You're learning how to use the co-pilot program, um, not how to uh, actually do the uh, computer science yourself. <laughs>